Well, we are excited to start a new series on First and Second Peter, the book of First and Second Peter. So if you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. And I want to encourage you to take notes. Over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at one chapter every week, hearing from different pastors. And it's important that as you understand God's word, that you have a holistic theology, that you understand how God was speaking in the Old Testament and how he's still speaking in the New Testament. You understand how 1 Peter chapter 1 correlates with 1 Peter chapter 5. So get out your notes, turn your phone on airplane mode, and let's, uh, let's dive in this morning. As you turn to 1 Peter 1, uh, I also want to make a quick plug for Sunday school. Sunday school is a wonderful opportunity to build Christian friends and community and learn and deepen your understanding of God and what he's done for you and how we ought to live our lives. I would challenge you to find a Sunday school class. We've got adult Sunday school in all three services during the 8, 9, 30, and 11. We've got kids and youth Sunday school happening at the 9, 30. And so be a part of that. Plug in. And also, you'll notice in the west end of the lobby, uh, you'll see a display out there for some shared interest groups. Shared interest groups are essentially it's uh, essentially um, coming together in a hobby that you love with other Christians, doing that hobby together. We've got exercise groups. We've got pickleball group. We've got a mountain biking group. We've got camping group. We've got a, a driveway fire pit group. We've got just about everything that, that you could possibly want. And the idea is to have Christian community with your brothers and sisters and that be an opportunity to invite people who don't know the Lord that can be around godly people and realize, hey, I'm not so different from my neighbor and then eventually share the gospel through that. So if you're interested in either of those things, Sunday school or shared interest group, find a pastor, we'll get you pointed in the right way. Hopefully, you've made it to First Peter. So I wanna start with an overview. Who is Peter? Well, Peter was one of Jesus's 12 disciples. And in and, and John 18, Peter does something that he says, I'll never do. He denies that he's one of Jesus' disciples, standing in front of a fire just outside the courts of Caiaphas, the high priest's house, and a servant girl comes up to him and says, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? As Jesus is being on trial right now, about ready to be crucified, he says, no, I'm not him. I'm pretty sure I saw you. I'm not with him, I don't know him, and he denies Jesus. And then after Jesus is crucified, and he is raised to life, and after the resurrection in John chapter 21, Jesus reinstates and recommissions Peter to preach the gospel. In Acts chapter two, we read that Peter fulfills that, that uh, commissioning, and he preaches on the day of Pentecost, and how many are saved that day when he preaches the good news of Jesus? 3,000. 3,000 people. And then in Acts chapter 4, Peter standing before the same religious leaders who are intimidating that he was standing in John chapter 18, all afraid, worried for his life. They tell him, you stop preaching this good news of Jesus. You stop talking about Jesus. And he goes, no way, Jose. I can't stop, won't stop preaching the good news of Jesus. And there's this huge transformation of Peter from John 18 to Acts chapter four, and that's our author today. In verse one, we see that Peter writes these two letters to the strangers in the world, or some translations might read scattered exiles or aliens, and then he lists several different areas in which they live. Now, most scholars agree that many of whom Peter is writing to are those who were there on the day of Pentecost. So as people have come in to Jerusalem to celebrate these religious activities, um, they were saved and then they go their separate ways. These people aren't necessarily literally displaced, but Peter is emphasizing that their true citizenship, your true citizenship is where? It's in heaven. We're just temporary journeyers, I don't know what you call it, passing through, going to our forever home in heaven. It's important to know some of the major themes, as you see on the screen uh, in this book, such as separation for holy living, submission to God, suffering for Christ, our response to that suffering, the joyful hope we have in Jesus, our true citizenship. And while I wish I had time to preach all of chapter one this morning, I can't do that. I know you guys are sad that you don't get to hear me preach for an hour like my dad likes to preach for an hour, but to briefly summarize the first 12 verses, 
Peter reminds his audience to rejoice. Turn to your neighbor and say, rejoice. Rejoice because they have a living hope through the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And despite trials, despite tribulations, despite the testing of your faith, we look forward to the reward waiting for us in heaven. I look forward to that day. We sang about it. What a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see, right? We look forward to the living hope. Now in verse 13, we see what the proper response ought to be to the saving power and grace of Jesus Christ. So let's stand together. We're gonna read the scripture. If you forgot your Bibles, I've got a couple really big ones on the screen for you to follow along. Peter says this, therefore, meaning in view of salvation, in view of what God has done, in view of what's coming, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy." Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life that was handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without spot or blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Heavenly Father, this morning we turn our eyes to your word and to you. May our spirits be in tune with your spirit, and would you speak, God, to every heart. You'd open up our minds, you'd open up our eyes, that we might see and hear what you have for us, God. I pray that you would flow through me, communicate exactly what you need to communicate to each and every individual here. I pray for those who doubt that they can hear your voice that this morning they would clearly hear what you have to say to them. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Corey, amen, amen. You may find your seats, give a high five to your neighbor as you sit down, say, we are ready. The title of my message this morning is Holiness. So agreeing with the Apostle Paul's writings, Peter says the only proper response in view of salvation, in view of what God has done for us, the only proper response to that is to live as Jesus did, to live a life that is holy. And at the end of my message, I'm gonna be asking those who realize that there's an area in their life that does not accurately reflect the life of Jesus to come to this altar area as a symbolic step of you laying down that area and surrendering it to God. We'll end in a time of prayer. And so I want you to be ready to respond if the Lord is speaking to you today, let's be repentant. Let's have our hearts filled with the Spirit of God that empowers and enables us to live a holy life. So the first thing I want to highlight this morning is in verse 13, if you look there, where Peter instructs our minds to be fully sober. Go ahead and underline fully sober in your Bible. Now, while it's obvious that the Bible speaks against physical drunkenness, I believe that Peter is speaking against any form of mental intoxication. So for me, this was a little bit of a wake-up call. I think that we have all heard sermons, we've heard sayings, we've maybe listened to TED Talks about the importance of positive thinking, right? Don't, don't be diluted in toxic thoughts. Don't dwell on the past or about the pain or on the hurt that someone caused. The book of Philippians even says, think about things that are true and right and noble and admirable and, and worthy of praise. Think about such things. But hear me, church, being sober of mind is more than just avoiding toxic thoughts because your mind, your mind can be drunk with neutral things. Now, I have this amazing ability to completely focus on 
and obsess over one thing, and that one thing can change just in a flash, right? In the summer months, I tend to obsess over my shared interest group, which is mountain biking. I love mountain biking. I love the adrenaline from mountain biking. I, I can't wait to do bigger and, and better things in mountain biking. I think, how can I spend money on my mountain bike to make me a safer, better mountain biker? Where can I go? Can I go to British Columbia and do Whistler Bike Park? Can I go down to Bentonville, Arkansas? I think about mountain biking, but then towards the end of the summer, my mind starts to, to drift off of mountain biking and I begin to obsess over something else. See, bow season starts October 1st every single year. And I begin to shoot my bow. I begin to just dream. I make sure I've got all of my, my, my broad heads and I've got all my pins gauged exactly where I want and I'm confident in my shot. I dream of shooting a massive 180, 200 inch deer. I have nightmares of missing that 180 200 inch deer I check my trail camera pictures I just go crazy over bow hunting now I have this hypothesis that if you're anything like me and you carry the XY chromosomal makeup you're probably like me but I look at this text and Peter is instructing us to not let our minds be intoxicated Period. Instead, focus on the fact that Jesus has saved us, that he's coming back, and in the meantime, he has called us and commissioned us to further advance the kingdom of God. See, mental intoxication is anything that distracts us from allowing God to fulfill his purposes in and through our life. Living sober of mind is an aspect of holy living. And Jesus is the perfect example of living fully alert and sober-minded. There was nothing that distracted him from fulfilling God's will in and through his life. So I ask you, church, I ask you, what consumes your thoughts? What is your mind consumed with? Are you being distracted and consumed with temporal things of this world? As I said, I stepped on my toes all week long in this text. Let us not be wrapped up in the temporal, but let us be wrapped up in the eternal. Let us be wrapped up with the, the fully alert ability to look at our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends, our family members, and realize that we are all souls headed one place or another, and we have a work that Christ has set before us to accomplish and to do. So let us live fully alert and sober-minded so that we can fulfill God's purpose in our lives and through our life. What consumes your thoughts? Taking a look at verse 15 and 16, Peter says, but just as he, who is he in this text? Jesus. Who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Did you know that there are wrong reasons to live a holy life? One wrong reason to live a holy life is to earn God's love and his salvation. There is nothing that you can do to earn your way to heaven. Verse 18 tells us it's not silver and gold that redeemed you. The book of Ephesians, Paul writes, it's not by man's works that you are saved, lest any man boast. There is absolutely nothing that you can do to save yourself, and there's nothing that you can do to earn God's love. Yet there are so many believers that live in this constant fear and this insecurity that they are doing enough for God to love them or accept them to heaven. If I don't smoke, if I don't chew, if I don't go with girls that do, I'm going to make it to heaven, right? No. That's, that's not. Look at verse 14, okay? Peter refers to believers as obedient children. And then in verse 17, he spells it out that God is our Father, right? Scripture says God demonstrated his love for us in this 
while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know what that means? It means that before you placed your trust in Jesus and called on the name of Jesus to be saved, God loved you. That means before you taught your first Sunday school lesson, God loved you. That means before you wrote your first check and tithe to God's money, God loved you. That means before you did anything for Christ, God loved you while you were a sinner, dead in your sin, destined for hell, God loved you. You didn't earn it, you don't deserve it. There's a pretty popular song that was written about that. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away, right? God's love cannot be earned. I have a a three, a four, and a six-year-old at home, and your prayers are coveted. (laughs) They are my children, and I am their father, and I love them all equally, and there is nothing that they could do that would stop me from loving them the same. However, their obedience definitely affects how I am pleased with them. This past Wednesday, we got done with church. I took the three kids home. Elizabeth stayed here and did whatever Elizabeth does, and I take the kids home on Wednesday, and I love that time because I get to lay the kids down all by myself. There's no, I want mom to lay me down. No, I'm their favorite tonight because I'm your only option tonight, right? I take all three kids, get them ready, brush your teeth, jammies on, and uh, we head into Essie, who's our youngest three-year-old, into her room, and I read two books with all three kids. Sam comes in, he brings me a third book. He says, Dad, I wanna read this book. I said, Sam and Paisley, I need you guys to go into the other room. I need to lay your sister down. Sam is the perfect child that he is, huh? Takes the book, and he walks out of the room. He goes in the other room. Paisley stands up, and she may or may not have an attitude of um, someone in our family. Uh, t- t- Taylor, I mean, Paisley stands up, she turns around and says, no, I want to read that book now. I said, Paisley, did daddy ask you to go to your room or did daddy tell you to go to your room? But I want to read it now. I said, go to your room. She went to her room. She's throwing a tantrum, very Taylor-esque, and just letting the whole world know. I'm, I'm throwing shots over here, Taylor. I love you. But you've said it. You've actually apologized to me for Paisley's behavior, that somehow it's, so it's true, okay? She's letting the whole world know that she ain't having it. She's not happy, right? So I finish with Essie. I sing. I pray. I lay her down. And then I walk into Paisley's room. And I sit down on the bed and I tell her to take some deep breaths. (sighs) Okay, and she's working herself down. And I said, Paisley, I was going to read that book with you and Sam, but your little sister needs more sleep than you and your brother. But because you disobeyed me, I'm not gonna read a book to you, just Sam is gonna get to read this book. See, the Bible tells us that you're to obey your mom and dad, to honor your mom and dad, right? And so we prayed, she asked for forgiveness against me. I pointed that sin, not just between me and her, but between her and God, and I said, ultimately, you sinned against God tonight. You need to tell God you're sorry. And we, we had this moment, I did my best to, to usher that and, and to, to take opportunity in that moment. And I prayed with her, sang with her, laid her down, and Sam and I, the perfect child, read the book, went to bed, right? Now, At any point in time, did my love for Paisley become less because of her disobedience? No. Was I pleased with her behavior? No. Was I going to bless her behavior? No. Did I somehow love Sam more because he obeyed? No. My love for all of my children never wavers despite their behavior. However, their decisions always have consequences that can either be a positive consequence, a positive result, or a negative consequence. See, I think of Matthew chapter three when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. 
And it records that as Jesus steps into the river and he's baptized, that the heavens opened and the spirit, like in form of a dove, came down, rested upon Jesus and remained on him. And then a voice from heaven says, this is my son whom I love, right? With him, I am well pleased. You notice how those things are separate. He could have said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I'm not pleased with what he's doing right now. See, God's pleasure in you and his love for you are disconnected. He loves you and will love you. If you're wondering, man, I I just, I've done too much and God could never love me. That's, that is the number one lie that the enemy wants to speak to you. We sang a song, who the sun sets free is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes I am. That is who you are. And whether you've been redeemed as that or not, that is up to you. But God loves you and his pleasure does follow in suit of whether or not you choose to trust him and obey his ways. If you're living a holy life to earn God's love or earn salvation, God wants to free you from that bondage of the law. God wants to open up your eyes so that you would see yourself as a beloved child, as a beloved son, as a beloved daughter of God. And he wants to change your heart so that you would do the right thing out of desire and not out of some form of manipulation. Now, how does this happen? Well, we remember what Christ has done for us, and it will launch us, it will motivate us to obey and live a holy life. Why do we love? Because he first loved us. Everything that you do, every sermon that I preach, Every act of charity that you do should be stemmed out of a response of God's love in your life. Another wrong reason for living holy is for the sake of your reputation. Reputation is a powerful thing, but it's also a very dangerous thing. I remember growing up, I did a lot of things that I was not proud of for my reputation. I wanted people to like me, I wanted to be cool. But on the same hand, there were a lot of things that I didn't do because I knew I had a reputation and I wanted to protect that reputation. See how it's a double-edged sword? But the only reputation we should be concerned about is maintaining is God's reputation. Look at verse 17 in your scripture. Since you call on a father who, what? Judges each person's work impartially. Live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Note that God is not just our father, but he is our judge. Hear me 930, hear me online. When we live a holy life, For our namesake and our reputation, we have believed the lie that there is more than just one judge. There is only one judge. We shouldn't fear what man thinks of us. See, Jesus didn't live holy and he didn't live an obedient life so that everybody would love him. In fact, his obedience to God made a lot of people hate him. His obedience, God, even led to his death on the cross. Jesus didn't feed the 5,000 people so he could have 5,000 new friends. Because you read that story and he goes around the other side of the lake and those 5,000 people follow him. And then he just says, hey, you just came over here for a free meal. Follow me. And they all leave. Thousands of people leave. And he's not worried about his reputation. He's not saying, come back. I need a crowd. I need people to love me. I need you to like me. The reason why he fed 5,000 people was to demonstrate that God was his father and that God has a saving power and that his message was true. That all who call on the name of his name, Jesus, shall be saved. Living a holy life will no doubt help your reputation, but your reputation should never, ever be more important than God's reputation. Jesus was a conduit of God's mercy, of his grace, of his gifts, 
of his power, and we should be the same. And the cleaner of a conduit that we are, meaning the more holy we live, meaning the closer we walk with God and he purifies us and empowers us by his Holy Spirit, the more that we can be used by God for God. Say, well, God, I wanna be used in mighty ways. Well, let's start with cleaning up our lives a little bit by the power of the Holy Spirit enabling us and helping us to do that so that we can be used in mighty ways. So why do we need to live holy? Verse 16 gives us the reason for living holy, and it's very simple. It's because he is holy. God delights in things that reflect his moral character. Reflections always bring our attention back to the source. If I'm looking in a window and I see a reflection of a person, I'm going to turn around and I'm gonna look for that person. If I see a reflection on the wall or something bright from a watch or jewelry, I'm gonna look, what what is that? What is that, where's that coming from? See, reflections always draw our attention to the source. When we reflect the character of God, People will be drawn and search for that source. They will search for God. Thursday evening, I mowed my lawn for like the third time all summer. Praise the Lord, but I'm thankful for the rain, right? Anybody else with me? It's like you know that you're supposed to pray for rain because that affects so many people's lives, our lives. You know, we needed it, but how many, like, just being honest, like, really liked not having to mow every other day? Really, just me and Troy. Me and Troy. We're kindred spirits, okay? Mowed for like the third time, and, and I'm mowing, and Sam is out there with his new uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi jet or something like that, and he's following me footstep for footstep. I'm just walking, and he's walking right on my trail. I turn, try not to chop his toes off, go like that. He follows me, and I just had this thought as I was mowing, and I pray that the footsteps that I leave behind are worthy of him following. See, children naturally want to reflect their parents. And this might sound like a cliche question. This might sound a little old school, but are you a child of this world where you try to look and act and dress as close to the world as you possibly can? Or are you a child of God, following our Father's footsteps, reading in the scriptures and in the gospels of how Jesus lived his life, of how Jesus responded to persecution, of how Jesus sacrificially gave his life? We as Christians should delight in imitating and reflecting God both because he's our father and because his moral excellence is inherently beautiful and desirable. To be like God is the best way to be. In just a couple minutes, I'm gonna invite anyone forward who realizes that maybe you've been reflecting the wrong things to come forward to this altar just saying, God, I need your help. God, I'm coming down here, I'm laying down my desires, I'm laying down just these shortcomings. Maybe it's, it's greed that has been driving you. Maybe it's man's reputation that's been driving you into good works. Maybe you're living a life of unforgiveness or gossip or laziness. Maybe it's a mental intoxication and your mind is just consumed with everything but God's kingdom and advancing it. I want you to be ready to respond. An altar is not a place of embarrassment. The altar is a place of empowerment. The last question I want to answer is what makes God holy? If we are to be holy as he is holy, what what are we even trying to strive for? What are we we trying to reflect? I think it's a, a fair question. See, what makes God a holy God is his unchanging character in his nature. God's character, the things that he does, the things that he says, and his nature are interwoven. They are one in the same. God's faithfulness, 
His love, his truth, his gentleness, his perfection, his justice, his mercy, his grace, every characteristic of God is who he is, and it's what makes him holy. It's not only the fact that God doesn't and cannot sin that makes him holy, it also involves what God does. One last time, I want to turn our attention to the text in verse 15, if you've got your Bible so open, your notes app. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. See, being holy, hear me, hear me, church. Being holy implies more than passive avoidance and restriction of what we can or cannot do. It also conveys the idea of pursuing and fulfilling God's purposes in your life. When you feed orphans and you take care of widows, you are living holy. When you give God his tithe and you give to missions and to benevolence, you are living holy. When you live a life of forgiveness and you are gracious towards those who have wronged you, you are living holy. When you pray for your enemy and you love your neighbor, you are living holy. Living holy is more than just not sinning. It involves action and the action should stem from a heart change where you begin to desire what God desires. See, the only way to live in a way that is holy is to be filled and empowered with the Holy Spirit of God. He fills us and empowers us to withstand temptation, and then that same Spirit of God fills us and empowers us so that we can do the works that God has set in advance for us to do. He empowers us to the good works that he's called us to. It's, it's, it's both in the same. It's, it's holy living and it's holy actions. It's holiness. That's what God has called us to. Some of you guys are really, really good at avoiding temptations and living a pure life. But maybe God is calling you to equally take that attention, that fully alert mind, that fully sober mind, and not just avoid sin, but to launch you into action. And there's a ministry that God is speaking to your heart that you know right now, man, I need to be discipling inner city kids. I need to be spending more time with my grandchildren and less time doing whatever I do because I need to disciple these people. I need to be doing this. I need to be going down and serving with Joppa. I need to be going down and, and helping with the homeless. I need to be doing something to be holy. And God is placing that in your in in your heart right now pastor weaver spoke last week and he, he said something along this lines you can you can live a life that that doesn't sin and you avoid sin and still not be fully holy so i ask you this morning do you need the spirit of god to fill your heart, to empower you to withstand temptation? And do you need the Spirit of God to fill your heart, to empower you to do what God is asking you to do? Let's be a church that reflects God, where people would search what's different about them. What's just in the make-believe story that Dave told, what's different about Steve? What's different about Ron? What's different about Jeremiah? What's different about Jason? What's different about Tyler, about Kelly, about Ryan? What's, what's different? And they go searching for what lies inside you. That is God. I want you to stand, close your eyes across the room. I ask every eye closed. If you're watching online, I want you to stand too. You need, you've been sitting on your your rear too long, you need to stand up, get the blood flowing. I want you to close your eyes. And I believe that God is speaking to every heart. Why do we close our eyes, right? We close our eyes so that we're not distracted. What is, what is God speaking to you? He might be revealing areas in your life that don't properly reflect 
holy living as Jesus lived. He might be adjusting the why behind your holy living. And you realize that you've been living holy for the wrong reasons. And this morning he's adjusting that and there's a heart change that's happening. So Jesus, right now to your people, we are thankful for a spirit that convicts us because you love us too much to leave us where we're at. We do not run from this, but we run to it, Lord, and we lay it down at the altar and we say, fill us, equip us, empower us to be as you are. With every eye closed and head bowed, you just say, Pastor Austin, this morning I feel like God has has spoken something to my heart. There's an area that I need to lay down that does not properly reflect that of God's. Would you just slip your hand up? I wanna pray for you. You Say, I've heard from the Lord, yeah. Who else, is there anyone else? Yes, 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 Jesus, let your people be sensitive to your spirit right now. I pray that you would equip every hand that is that is up right now, that you would empower them, that your cleansing forgiveness would sweep over them. They wouldn't feel guilt and shame, but they would feel the grace that propels them to the future that you have for them. And with every eye closed, I wanna give opportunity for anyone who has not stepped into the family of God. You have never heard that Jesus loves you, that while you were a sinner, Christ died for your sins so that you could be in a relationship with God. You could receive the promise of everlasting life in heaven. And you would say, this morning, I, I trust in God's plan. I trust wholly in what God has done for me. I don't trust in what I can do for God or my deserving, you know, whether or not I deserve this, but I trust in what God has spoken and said. And you'd say, for the first time, I'm asking Jesus in my life with every eye closed, the head bowed. Is there anyone here? Raise your hand and say, Austin, I'm asking Jesus to come into my heart. Thank you, Jesus. This morning, Lord, we just invite your spirit to purify us, to fill our hearts. Speak to us this morning. Allow your people to be moved by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We're gonna end in a time of song and I want you to pray these words. As we sing these words, this is not just passive time. This should not just be familiar, although it is familiar. I want you to make these words your prayer. And if you raise your hand, or maybe you didn't, and you just want to come forward to the altar saying, God, I am surrendering this. I want to be used of you. I want to be empowered by you. Would you come down and join me in the altar as we sing this song? Jesus, we are thankful for your grace that abounds. But God, we do not take advantage of it. We walk in it, but we don't take advantage of it because we are constantly reminding ourselves of what you have done for you are a good God who loves us and you took the first step and we are simply responding this morning. So fill us, equip us, empower us by the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead or that same spirit raised this dead man to life. Take these dead bones and allow them to be living. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen.